Hi, my name is Melissa Wallen. I'm director of the Dela Cruz Collection located in Miami's Design District. I'm joined by Rosa Dela Cruz, collector and founder and of the Delos Dela Cruz Collection. And Carlos Dela Cruz is just off camera. Um, we thank you for tuning in to this third and final discussion for the symposium, Felix Gonzalez Torres, What Remains a Celebration of the Artist's Life and Legacy. Before we begin, we'd like to thank Sylvia Carvin Covina, Executive Director and Chief Curator of the Bass Museum for inviting us to participate in this wonderful event and the team of the Bass for bringing this together. An additional thank you to the Felix Gonzalez Torres Family Archive, all of the panelists who have participated, our colleagues at the Dela Cruz Collection and Art Bridges Foundation whose support made this possible. This evening's, com evening's conversation is entitled The Ever-Present Role of the Exhibitor in Felix Gonzalez Torres' Work. Moderated by Andrew Cashel, Director and Felix Gonzalez Torres Liaison at Andrea Rosen Gallery, this conversation brings together three individuals who have a relationship with the ever-evolving -evol potentiality ingrained in the work of Felix Gonzalez Torres. Joining us in conversation are panelists Rosa de la Cruz, Elena Filipovic, and Andrea Rosen, president of the Andrea Rosen Gallery, the Felix Gonzalez Torres Foundation, which she founded in 2002. And in addition, Andrea is the executor of the estate of Felix Gonzalez Torres. Uh, I'd like to also say that Elena is the director and curator of the Kunsthal Basel. So without further ado, I will turn to Andrew to take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you, everyone. So as I give this very brief introduction to this panel, I'm sharing some images, which Denise, you can, you can run. Um, but uh, these are images of Felix Gonzalez Torres's work, uh, but I'm not gonna talk about each image specifically. Uh, I just wanted to begin by offering a visual sense of the expansive and flexible nature of Felix's work. Um, and to begin this panel, I just wanted to speak for a moment about why it seemed meaningful to bring these three particular individuals together. So we, we, we will hear a bit from Rosa about the De La Cruz collection and from Elena about the exhibition she has curated of Felix's work. Um, I think the images are not playing. So if they could just keep scrolling while I'm talking, that would be great. Um, and so what I wanted to highlight, just first of all, as we get started, is something profound that Rosa, Elena, and Andrea share, which is that Felix really affected each of them. And each of them has also affected Felix. And it's important to note that this is not, this is not something that was limited to Felix's lifetime. Over the years, and really on an ongoing basis, each of them has experienced firsthand um, a, a deep understanding of Felix's work. And that's an understanding that continues to evolve, which is also very important to note up to and through the present day. And this understanding of Felix's work, uh, also very important to note, it's an understanding that is open-ended. It is inherently unstable and permeable and susceptible to influence. Um, just as each of us has the potential to influence Felix's work itself, which is something that I'm looking forward to talking more about with these panelists. Rosa, Elena, and Andrea can each speak with uh, a unique and particular fluency to a, a very compelling and unique condition in Felix's work, which is that although we may think we know what Felix's work means or, or what you know, one particular work means, it is through the experience often of installing it over and over again, over a long period of time, that the work can unveil itself in different ways. And I should say that this is also certainly true for viewers of Felix's work, um, but this panel is specifically looking at the, bringing these three individuals together who can speak about this from, from the perspectives of exhibitors. And so as exhibitors, or as it were, as, as owners, a particular set of decisions around the work may only seem possible or, or even legible or accessible once another set of decisions has been made and played out and learned from. 
And it's another very interesting aspect of Felix's work, how it challenges you to, to continue working with it in new ways, engaging it in new ways. And so in this regard, Felix's work actually has a way of leading owners and exhibitors, but of course also audiences to new information and insights, even this many years after it was made. And so one thing I wanted to mention also just to set the ground for this conversation is a question that I will try to pose directly to each of the panelists later in this talk, which is how have you changed Felix's work and how has Felix's work changed you? So Rosa, I know that you have mentioned when you speak about Felix, it's always in the present tense. And of course, I think that has a lot to do with strategies Felix rigorously employed in order to ensure that his work would always exist in the present. And I think it's very perceptive of you to feel this way and to express this, but I also think it's not a coincidence that, that you feel this way, that you find yourself referring to Felix in the present tense. Um, in fact, I think it's, it's because this apparent ease with which the work continues to exist in the present moment and not as an artifact of one specific context or time or place or another, um, it's because of this that th this, is, this is related to the work's gift of openness, I guess, uh, if that makes sense. So as I hope that we can talk about later in this talk, to a certain extent, this, this also is not a given, this openness in the work. It is actually a delicate condition uh, and perhaps even an, an endangered condition at some moments. And it's really to a large extent, a responsibility of owners and of exhibitors, also of scholars to uphold um, this nature of openness in the work. So in this regard, the care that the three of you, Rosa, Andrea and Elena exercise in continually contributing the work is really truly essential. Um, so with that, uh, I'm honored to hand it off to you, Rosa. Thank you. Well, Carlos is here with me and he's hiding, but I, I want him to come in because really this collection is Carlos and I together that he is always be behind it. I couldn't have done it without Carlos and Felix knew that because Felix was a very close friend of, of ours. And maybe that's why we refer to Felix in the present tense, because a friend is always in the present tense. And we value his work and we value him as a person. And um, I mean, the, the, our, our exhibitions, the first work that we install is Felix's work. And it all, it's always changing because I, I know he liked the idea of change and not having the same momentum. So. This year, we are very happy because we have called our exhibition A Possible Horizon. And A Possible Horizon comes from, can you change them? So if you can go to the next slide. So this is the vitrine. A Possible Horizon comes from a letter that Felix sent us uh, two or three years before he died, talking about a possible horizon. And I'm going to read what, what it says here. You jumped a little bit. Yeah, you, no, you, I had it here, Melissa. Here we go, a possible horizon. He said, a possible horizon, light blue bulby skies, blue warm light waters. Felix was very generous. He was always sending postcards or books, something to remember. And this is a vitrine that we have here in, in the museum where I have a lot of those postcards and uh, photographs. And I like to show some of them because one of them, I love it because it, it refers to Andrea. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah. Thank you. The, well, he, this is the letter with the possible horizon and the two works in the back are two books that he sent one of Pasolini and the other one of Rilke because he was very well read and he always loved to, to talk with that, to that uh, with us. And- um, Next slide. The next slide. Oh, this slide, I love it because it's this photograph is uh, Felix uh, sent it to us and he, here. It says, this is my baby, Andrea's incredible gift of love. 
named Dino four months, which Dino is his dog here. So his image. dog, so he was always sending photos of his dog, his cat, but this dog, he said it was a, a, Andrea's incredible gift of love. So Andrea, I mean, it's really nice to, to keep it here in the museum. Next slide. Next slide. Oh, now this is a facade of the museum. We built, uh, we've always shown the our artwork in our house in Key Biscayne. And 10 years ago, Carlos said, why don't we build a museum in the design district? And I thought it was a great idea because our collection has grown and we couldn't install it in the house anymore, even though the house is full of art. So we built this 30,000 square foot museum in the design district. And we said, what do we have for the facade? We don't want a name. We don't want to say De La Cruz collection. So Felix's billboard is our facade. And it doesn't say anything, just has the billboard there. So every guest that walks in walks under Felix's billboard, which is great. Before they enter the museum, the first uh, the first um, how you say image that they see is Felix's image. Now this year, where is the next, um, slide? The next slide, please? This is the pavilion. Oh, that's the the build that billboard. Nancy Spector called us and said, Rosa and Carlo, would you lend me your billboard for the Venice Biennial? And of course we said yes. And this is the, the pavilion in the um, uh, Biennial. I, I don't, I'm not putting any of the pictures of the, um, of the billboard because the pictures that we're taking in Venice weren't very good. And I think you can see with this and here, this inside this pavilion and outside was uh, Felix's work. And Next slide. Yes. So, of course, pictures of Felix, we have them all over. Next. So again, we go back to the museum and now let's go inside the museum. And the first room this year is works by Glenn Ligon and Felix González Torre. And it happened that I saw uh, Glenn's exhibition that he did in Naples, Italy this year. And everything was about Pasolini. And I, I said to Glenn, Glenn, this, your work, I mean, reminds me so much of Felix. And I said, I'm gonna, I, I acquire some of his work. And then you know what he said? Rosa, I love if you could install my work with Felix. Next slide. So this, the, when you go, come in, you see on the right side, uh, the neon of uh, um, Glenn Ligon of the Million Man March in Washington. And it happens that we have, we had acquired um, Felix's hand of the nurse in the AIDS pavilion. And I couldn't believe it was the same hand. When I saw Glenn's, it's the right hand, it's open, you see the lifeline. And Felix had told me, what I did with this photograph, I extended the lifeline because I wanted the nurse in the AIDS pavilion to have a long life because he had been so generous to Ross. So here you have um, the the neon and the, the we also have installed in this uh, wall the two rings that was a gift of from the foundation to us and also the um, the puzzle of the two empty chairs Paris last time is there. Next, you know, Rosa, I just realized that something so interesting about about that installation is that um, those those two silver rings. It's this figure of the double which is a really significant motif in Felix's work. And it's the same in that puzzle, which is the two images of empty Love chairs. And, and you also replicate that in your installation with, with Glenn's work of the hand and Felix's work of the hand. So I think that's, that's such an interesting aspect of that. But it was really thing. Glenn's idea. Glenn, Glenn loves so much his, uh, Felix's work that he really, he said, please install my work. So we figured out the first room is going to start with Felix and Glenn. So now this is another wall in that same room. And the work on the right is Glenn's, and it's taken from James Baldwin, um, Strangers. Strangers in the Village, the book. And then on the left is Felix's work on title, um, 31, days, 31 of days of blood work. And that's the month when Ross dies of AIDS. And it's very difficult to explain because the work, when you see it, it's, it's almost white because it has this graph in pencil and this uh, line going up. So you really, by looking at it, you can describe it. 
but I know that there is the month when Ross dies of eight. And this is the way Felix wanted to remember it. And imagine when I told Glenn I was putting these two works together, he was in heaven. He loved the idea. Next. The next, the next to this room, we have this installation, which again, uh, it was con a little controversial to me because I said, my God, the, the likes of Felix, where do I, 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 I was, I'm always scared because I, I want to do things right. I want to do them perfect. And it's so difficult to be perfect. And the lights, I wanted to put them in, in the same room. And uh, we had acquired this enormous w work of Wade Guyton, these six panels. And I said, oh my God, what do I do? And you know what Wade said? Rosa, I love the idea of having the lights because I would like every time they photograph my work to be with Felix. So, you know, to get this from artists that are alive today and they still remember Felix and they value his work. And of course, Mark Bradford is the other work and Mark came here to speak and he loved the idea of being with Felix. So for us, Felix is very important because he also, through him, we relate to other artists. So he's been central to everything we do. Next slide. Next slide, please. And here you can see an alternative uh, installation of, of, the, of the same of the work. same work of the light piece. This is a year that we did it on the third floor and it's surrounded by Felix's photographs. So this work is always changing. This year we install it in that room, but next year we'll do it in another. Next so time. next. You know, you know, Rosa, I also just wanted to mention just before you move on one really interesting thing. When you talk about how the work is always changing and the light string is a really good physical example of that. But also in works like, like Untitled 31 Days of Blood Works, what's interesting is that in that work, this, the story that you mentioned, which sounds like it was like an anecdote that there was something personal that Felix shared with you as a friend in conversation. What's interesting is that there was also an instability in that work because it's not something that he is like hitting you over the head with, right? It's, it's not uh, an overt part of the work. It's, it's um, you know, there are so many things that inform a work like that. Um, and there's a kind of abstraction that happens there. And there's a, a way that Felix's experiences and the things that motivated him um, are sort of filtered through the work and, and they remain open for interpretation. Almost in, it's kind of analogous to how that light string is open to your interpretation as an owner, how you choose to install it. Oh, so and you know, I think I've, that's also, kind of, I've also installed the work in a line because I remember yeah. they're telling me you yeah. can install the canvas is in a line one week you can install one week and also we in the third floor we one year we installed it all around the floor so wow. all the, they were all in sequence and so I love that piece because when you say thirty one days of blood work you say where's the blood and it's the memory yeah. of the suffering that that's the, where the blood is. But I mean, those works, I mean, you don't know how much Carlo and I enjoy and Melissa now because Melissa has become a super fan of Felix González Torre. <laughs> so every oh, time yeah. we're going to do something, she thinks of Felix. It's hard to, to be, to become acquainted with his work and not become enthralled. Yeah. But. And did, Andrea, did, was there something, I think you, you were mentioning something at a certain point. Did you want to say something before we move on also about this? Um, I was just reflecting on Liliana's um, beautiful text and the, there were so many parts of it, but in particular in relationship to 31 Days of Bloodworks, the um, notion of a secret. And what's interesting is, um, and especially in relationship to Rosa and Carlos being such significant collectors, is that on the back of those 31 Days of Bloodworks, Felix um, included a lot of sort of, so to speak, secret information that's only accessible to the owner and, um, and very diverse information, very diverse um, material um, that's literally like taped to the back of them. And this idea of what is for the owner, what is additive, what is seen, what is, what is um, present even without it being seen. And there's so much, in relationship to what is this personal relationship of being an owner versus what the public sees and how that happens. And so it just sort of tied together with Liliana's relationship to the secret and also the role of ownership. And, and to that point, the relationship with the Glenn Ligon work that's next to it, if we can go back just really quickly to that image is um, 
with the 31 days of blood work and the, the uh, one more back, I think, Denise, one more, this one, is that within that piece by Glenn Ligon, you have a full narrative. So there is this information that is, is being shown, but at the same time is being hidden. And so in both of these works, you have these kind of uh, personal narratives that they're sharing with, with you or with the audience, the viewer, that is still Even you behind the abstraction. They, they're there. Exactly. The information is there. No, you're right. The Glenn Lyon is a text from um, Strangers. Baldwin Strangers in the Village. And you can't read it. Right. Just on the top line, you see a word. But right. the rest is the same as Felix. You have to... You have to spend time spend and really time. have a little bit more right. of a foundation in understanding yeah. the work. And can if, we I can, word? if I can interject, I would say, because um, Andrea, your point was exactly something I was thinking about as someone who had curated this particular piece, 31 Days of Blood Work, into an exhibition, that the beautiful thing is Felix left these messages, these secrets behind the canvases, but not only just for the owner, but actually for every future curator or installer. And this was the beautiful generosity, I think, of Felix's work, that he was thinking about the workers who would handle it and who would see the backside and would have privy to this, this almost conversation with him. Absolutely. So, so if we can go forward yeah. then go forward. to uh, the image of the platform, that one right there. So, well, this is on the second floor of the museum. Uh, you're gonna have a laugh, why do you, ha I have a platform, I'm not a platform person, but the first year that we opened the museum, since we're in the design district, Fendi, you know, the, the yeah, the fashion, the fashion yeah. house asked me if they could have their fashion show in the museum and they built a platform and you know what we left the platform and now we use the platform and right now we have the work of Felix we have this against him um, we have a uh, mantra Bernice Sterling Ruby so the the now the platform functions and this year because you know Miami like every place has been with with closed the museum for a few days. Then we open now, we, we have um, all these regulations at the entrance. And this year he said, what do we do with the candy piece? That portrait of that, which we've landed so many times and we've installed, it's always installed. And then we said, how do we, we can't tell people not to read it because I, I just felt that, that it was not in the nature of the work. So what we did was we installed it on top of the platform and instead of a corner, it's on a line. And we feel that uh, people, when they sit there, they get, oh, let's not, if, if they take it, it's because they really can't help it. But I'm not telling them don't eat the candy, but I, I am keeping a uh, distance of the public and the candy, which I don't know if it's right or not, but I, I didn't know what to do. And I didn't want to, to hide the candy either. So this is uh, the next slide. Mm, yes, it's, it's interesting, Rosa, that you are are sort of pushing the boundaries of what's uh, what's possible as an exhibitor, and you are feeling a sense of responsibility to you know the public. Um, and we talk so often about how you know we we don't use the word rules to describe. We use the words the terms like the specific yet open parameters of the work. Um, but with a work like this. It is, it is essential that, uh, you know, if it's publicly exhibited, that the public, any individual can, can take a piece of the work. You can't tell them that they can't, you can't put a stanchion around it. But, but this is, I think, a very interesting reflection that you're feeling there is maybe a need for, for some kind of um, uh, a little bit of a boundary, a sense of that, so. It, it makes me think a lot about how, Felix spoke about this idea of this cyclical nature of how you have an implosion of meaning and not just, um, and he talked about how, when did you use, when do you use the center and how you have the right to infiltrate the center and when do you use the margins? And it's really interesting because he also changed and shifted his bodies of work so that not everything was takeable. 
And your idea, and I haven't heard you describe it, that there was a you know, this sort of resistance to having people taking while you still allowed people to, it kind of created an implosion of meaning like Felix wanted where it's like, well, what happens if I can't take something? What happens if there's this limitation? And it creates more information when there are diverse experiences around the work. And um, interesting to hear that it's like, you know, in some way you, uh, it was easy, equally accessible, but also resistant and how much more meaning you created by creating an alternate experience, especially as you're an open space, open to the public who may have experienced this work in other ways and how you're inspiring your audience to have a completely and giving the gift of your audience having a completely different experience than they've had before with that work. It was, that's exciting to hear you say that. And here is uh, last year, an, Im an image of the way the candy was installed against one of our columns. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's in a corner, sometimes it's against a column. And then this year, Melissa and I said, what do we do? Because we, we, we have all these rules and regulations that I don't want to put them in. A, I don't right. have in the, any, I mean, at the entrance to the museum, there's people can um, wash yeah. their hands. We have an alcohol there and um, they just have to say if they've had a, if, if the, right, right. What, just what the, the, exactly. They have to to first say that, of course, they understand that there's an eight um, risk involved in going out in public during this time. But a conversation that we got into as we were trying to explore this dilemma was also the guidelines and kind of the way that this piece is in constant flux. So as you take the candies, that form is constantly shifting and changing. So where do those limits, where do the limits fall? How, how far can you stretch the shape or, or change no, the form? We asked the foundation if we could install it like that because another thing that we're very always careful is about how to present Felix's work. And we Next. always consult with the foundation because I trust Andrea Rosen. And I think Andrea is the person that knows more about Felix's work and she was probably his best friend. Yes. And I always think if I, in doubt, Ask Andrea. Next but you know, what's my answer always, Rosa? My answer is always, you have the right to determine those decisions within the parameters of the work. <laughs> yeah, but you so know what I mean, like Andrea. Sort of like no, back we, and Carlo and I, we both like respect you. Your respect, yeah, and then I'm saying, right. you're the, you know, that's how the work continues and lives. And like Andrew talked about at the beginning, this idea of your, you have altered the work you know, it's like, there's only so many molecules in the world and it's how they constantly shift and create to create new meaning. So you're keeping, you always talk about Felix in the present and the work is always in the present and he is always in the present and you're doing that. You're, you know, by your decisions and your willingness to constantly shift it. So that's always my answer to you. Thank you. <laughs> this is a, a really wonderful image of Rosa in, in uh, her home. There, yeah. Rosa and Carlos's home in 1991, the year the piece was created. And if you can go to the next slide, Denise, maybe Elena, you can talk a little bit about how yeah. you started to press the barriers uh, for your uh, exhibition that you put together. Uh, sure. Um, uh, the exhibition I organized in 2010 um, and 11 was called Specific Objects Without Specific Form. And it's kind of a funny story because it began by me, it was my first institutional curatorial job um, as a new curator. And I was asked to do a retrospective um, of Felix Gonzalez Torres's work by my director. And, um, and I started, I loved Felix's work, but I, I was by no means a specialist. And I wanted to, to do right by this work of an artist who had died too soon and there was the weight upon me of how do you organize a retrospective of someone who is not there to, um, to tell his story, to, um, to make the selection. And I read everything I could, every interview, and I came to uh, the conclusion that maybe the central, most important lesson, if, if lesson can be the word, that Felix had left behind through his work um, was one of questioning of authority. And I had to weigh this questioning of authority being central to the work with um, the fact that uh, retrospective is essentially authoritative in form. Um, now it's a longer story how I got there, but 
um, the end version was I thought it felt necessary to honor the work. And by that, I don't mean flatter the work, but truly honor it by understanding its, its um, radical thinking, its conceptual protocols, by um, finding a, a mode that would take its form from the work itself, um, which meant how do you make an exhibition that has no authority? Um, how do you make one that questions its own authority? And I ended up deciding that instead of one retrospective that would be authoritative um, because it sounded like Felix was um, questioned this at every aspect in his practice, um, the master narrative, the law, the father, um, all these things um, were in question in his work that I should instead make an exhibition where at every venue it was undone. I, I set up a version of the retrospective and then halfway through the show, it uh, was taken down and an artist who had been influenced by Felix's work, but had never met him, like I had never met Felix, would install their own version of a retrospective. So you have to imagine at each venue where this work was shown, where this exhibition was staged, and there were three venues in all, there was always two versions of the show. Um, and in that way, you could never sort of, you could see the act of responsibility that Felix made inherent um, to his work because each of us as curators had to be responsible for a different version of um, the show and that there was no somehow no truth um, because between these two versions, there was no right version of Felix Gonzalez Torres. It was always changing. Now this exhibition included a number of works from the De La Cruz collection. And I have to say, it was something that had to be organized in, because it took me quite a while to come to the concept. It was something that had to be organized in record time. And um, I, I'm almost embarrassed to say, because mm -hmm. no one would believe it, six months um, before the show opened, we had to get loans. And I know that we would have never managed to secure loans if in, uh, I hadn't been able to, first of all, go to the foundation, explain this idea that I'd come to and have it be so embraced um, by Andrea, by the foundation, that I think Andrea called every one of the lenders and said, you know, this is something, you know, although it doesn't meet the usual protocols, um, the time limits, this is something that you should lend for. And that allowed us to have an incredible range of possibilities um, for each of the artists to choose from in their version of the retrospective. That was a very quick and dirty version. Um, I'm sure it'll come up um, yeah, again, yeah, talk, yeah. but I'm sort of interrupting your, your presentation. No, no, I'm, I'm so happy. You can imagine that this is a conversation. So yeah. uh, and, and, and uh, you could explain this better than because I, I never saw an exhibition and when we put it, I told Melissa, Melissa said, let's ask Elena to, to, to do the explanation. So let, let's go back to the... We, we, we could go back, yeah, to, to just finish out um, Rosa's presentation, yeah, which actually I think does, it's, it's a nice little yeah. moment for, mm -hmm. for Elena to have given that, um, that sort of wonderful short accounting, mm -hmm. because these are some other images uh, in Russ's slideshow of that work, Untitled Portrait of Dad, in, in different ex exhibitions, um, different installations from this traveling mm -hmm. show. Lovely, so. Next image. Well, this image is taken in our home in Kibis Game. And we have at the entrance to the house, we have an atrium with a glass uh, roof and uh, Jim Hodges, who's an artist very close to us. And the first show that we did in this museum, Jim came and he curated the show. And this, the, this is the mirror piece of, um, of Jim mm -hmm. that we installed it in this atrium. And of course it reflects everybody that goes by, you see the reflection on the wall. And then we- You can also see the portrait of dad there yeah, in the corner as well. We, we placed the candy piece there portrait that and the stack piece in the same atrium with Jim. And this is basically, I mean, right now it's installed like that. And, and it, again, it's the doubles. 
the double, little, that Andrew touched on a bit, this idea of the double and this, the, double, yeah. the two, if you can go to the next slide, Denise, the two stacks have messages on them. Some were better than this place. Yeah, no are better than this place, which speak to that. Hmm? Yeah, that, that Robert has. Oh yeah, Robert home. Hobbs mentioned that he had that, he had framed them, which I was happy because I, I love how everybody takes care of the, of the world. They become disseminated they through become the world. No, and everybody does something else. And of course you have somewhere better than this place and nowhere better than this place, which seem completely contradictory, but, but it's all about this kind of subjective, yeah. subjective reality, yeah. which I think that Felix was very interested in expressing. Mm -hmm. I should also note some something we can we can continue I guess moving through some of these images because I I want to move save some time for the conversation if that's okay Rosa yeah. I'm um, gonna go fast but, now so you yeah. no this one is but, the stack with Albert Ellen. no I, the thing is these images I I find them I love to look at them that's why I, I brought them to you because yeah we, Felix with Albert Ellen, very seldom you see that installation we have a very large collection of Albert Ellen. And we know he's an artist that Felix would have liked. So this year at the museum, we have the work, the double stack installed in front of the, these paintings. So next image. This is one, once we lent the, the stack piece. This is an exhibition. Where it's was this? It's the Metropolitan Art Center in Belfast, in Ireland. Belfast, it's just Ireland. to show the work within a different context yeah. outside of the space. Next image. And then this is an image that was um, that Andrew actually you shared with us, just to show the, the work in motion sure. to get a sense of, of the fact that you can actually take the stack pieces. Hmm. So next, well, I don't know if you know, remember that image. That image is uh, the grave of Gertrude Stein and Alice B. Toklas in Paris, and Felix took the photograph with all the flowers there, and um, it's a work that I, we always have installed. In the, um, in the museum okay. and with all the work, what show more, more, the next the next slide slide. This is more work of Felix uh, on the um, the um, sand piece on the right side and the uh, the um, clouds on the left. And it's we I didn't do it on purpose that it happened. The work on the back is with Fredo Lam and with Fredo Lam. If you talk about Cuban culture, with Fredo Lam is sort of like the best known figure in Cuba. He, he, was an, uh, he was existed at the time of surrealism and he moved to Paris and he died in, in, in Europe. And so this is a 1942 piece. And I just said, oh my God, I didn't realize it. And I'm installing Felix's work next to Wilfredo Lam, but I didn't do it on purpose. And the room next to it is Ana Mendieta, which is another very important Cuban figure. But it happened out of coincidence. I, I can't say that I did it because I'm Cuban and I wanted the Cubans to be together. That's not the, that was not the idea. The idea is it happened like that. Next. And, and I think this is the final slide. It's a final so this slide. is just an image of our Rosa. friend Felix with Carlos. Carlos loved Felix. And he's always saying, what are we going to put this? Where are we going to install that? So here we are with Felix and we thank all of you and we thank Andrea especially for giving us the chance to participate. Thank you, Andrea. The, the work would not exist without you. And well, thank you. Thank you for Felix and thank you for you. And yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rosa. And well, it's actually, you, as, as, as you're mentioning Andrea, it's, I, I wanted to, I wanted to give Andrea some, some time to speak and probably in a little bit of a less structured way, but also I wanted to pose one question to you, Andrea, which I just, thought of today after we've talked so much about this panel, but a question that was submitted in advance was this really, I think, interestingly open-ended question. And we I kind of wasn't even sure how to interpret it, but it was about the ideal conditions for Felix's work. And there was a kind of poetry in that question that um, even in knowing, thinking about how to respond to it. And it made me think um, on the one hand of the essential parameters for Felix's work, you know, that one must be able to take a piece of candy or a sheet from a stack. And also that an owner, this is something that I think we haven't talked about today, an owner or an, an exhibitor of a candy piece, and Elena, maybe you can talk about this later as well, has um, the right to determine how they will replenish the work in a candy piece or a stack, you know, you could, you could choose to allow it to deplete to nothing 
and not regenerate it. Or you, every single day you could be bringing it back to, to um, the way you first installed it. There's such a range of possibilities there. So I wondered if you maybe could talk about this idea of an ideal condition for the work, but also about something that we talk about quite often, like the rights and responsibilities of an owner, of an exhibitor of Felix's work. Um, I was so uh, really taken by Mario and Liliana and uh, Maria and Elvis's panel and so much of, you know, this sort of unveiling of this early, this early work and this, these, um, um, and the root of his, uh, uh, that stays so much the same um, and how it has to, you know, um, Elvis brought up some sort of key points, but what is this relationship to the public? Um, and what is the, how do we um, even decide what is public and what is private? You know, it, it's an interesting thing that um, we think about it. It's almost as if when we are in our own homes, we think of ourselves as private, but aren't we still the public? Or so, you know, what is an ideal context of who is the ideal audience? Is the ideal, is the audience an audience of one equal to the audience of everybody seeing the work? You know, this idea of, um, and I think it goes back to that, I, you know, what I was saying before that Felix was also interested in this kind of, um, when is, when is the work most powerful? And that's why this idea of it trans, you know, transposing itself from one situation to another and from one person's role with the work to another is so essential because it's only in every single day that I have worked with Felix's work, I change my understanding of the work from the decisions that other people make, um, including you know literally every single day. Um, so contexts that allow for the work to even do that for me personally, if it's a personal question, I love contexts that are going to shift my understanding of the work as well as um, the possibility of, of others. And, um, but it's also, um, you know, Felix was purposefully, the body of work itself gives so much information. It's kind of shocking that this artist who knew that they were going to die, died so young, 38 years old, uh, was able to establish a body of work that was quite, um, you know, if he felt that there were too many candies and he had shown one, he would literally, if it was his main, uh, one of the things he said the most often was when in doubt, leave it out. And he felt that it was his right to determine the specificity of his body of work. And it was so specific that, um, that where was this perfect balance between light strings or stagnant works versus works that were malleable and how, but within that, you know, very determined body of work that he left behind very purposely, he also always left inconsistencies within each body of work or not inconsistencies, purposeful um, contradictions okay. and um, purposeful contradictions to a tenant of a body of work. The foundation's working on a project right now where we're writing out all the tenants of the work so that they're sort of can be public. But what's so fascinating about that project is to say, well, you know, candy part works may have these tenants, but these four works he purposefully created other rules for. And rules is not the right word. So, or, you know, structures, overall structures. So I think that um, I'm getting away from your question, Andrew, but uh, an ideal context is always changing. And I think just like um, if there's been a lot of uh, situations that talk about the work in one way, it's really exciting for, you know, so it depends on what's happened before, or as you said in your introduction, it's a continuation. So if the work's been spoken about in a certain way, it's, you know, then an ideal context may be something quite different. Um, and so it's a, it's a continuation. And that's also, as Mario said, that, you know, Felix is always alive because the work is always alive because his presence has influenced us so deeply I know that I have shifted the way that I think every single day because of Felix. Felix did this to the people that he knew. And Rosa and I were laughing about this other, the other day. She was talking about Felix and his generosity and how generous he is and how generous the work is. And we also you know, were laughing to say, well, within that generosity came the responsibility for us to 
take that on. And there's a, you know, an important subversive aspect to Felix's work in this way. Um, so uh, it's always shifting. Sorry. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you for that, Andrea. It, it also, it actually gets at a question that, that I wanted to, to pose to Elena, which is about um, something that we had mentioned. And um, I think you mentioned it briefly when you were talking about your exhibition, but this idea of, of influence, of, of mutual influence. I wanted to ask a bit, because I think your exhibition is such a great example. Um, you know, these three artists, for example, who were influenced by Felix. Um, but we've also kind of hinted at this idea that, um, that they, in their exhibitions, and certainly you and yours, also exerted an influence on Felix, on the work. Um, and so I wondered if you could just reflect a bit on that and how that played out in your exhibition. And, and for example, um, if it's a more straightforward way to say this, how, how your decision-making evolved over the course of your exhibition, you know, this idea that maybe certain decisions you only could have arrived at after being influenced and observing this like influence on the work. Um, but I also don't want to limit it to your, your exhibition also, how over the years you have felt this, this connection with Felix, this sort of symbiotic relation to the work, with the work. Can you also say who the other three artists, who the three artists were, Ellen? <laughs> Indeed, indeed. Um, so in this sort of motley exhibition, this exhibition in six parts um, that I organized, uh, the idea was that at every venue, there was always two versions. I would set up a version and then an artist. In the first case, it was Yan Vo. Uh, in the second, Carol Bove. And in the third, Tino Segal. So three artists who didn't know Felix, but who had in different ways been influenced by their work, installed their own version of their show with their own checklist, with their own determination of how things were shown um, that made each a sort of pendant or a contradictory version. And it was interesting to hear Andrea speak of Felix's sort of purposeful contradictions. Um, this was a show that offered no singular um, version of Felix's work, but also tried to show how mutable it was, to show how much the works had inbuilt the possibility to be shown um, differently. And for me, it was absolutely fascinating that each artist had their own version of Felix, that they were attracted to, were interested in, or moved or touched by different things, as each audience member has their own sort of approach um, and take on Felix's work. And usually in a, in a retrospective exhibition, you would only get one of those. You would get the institutional or curatorial version of Felix, or in a, in a sort of book that would usually present an image of a work, you would usually only get one image that would show one way that a candy pile, that a certain candy pile or paper stack um, was shown. Although we know that Felix left deliberate um, openness. He called them, you know, ideal heights or ideal weights. Um, nothing was controlled. He re specifically relinquished control by giving over responsibility. And so as a curator working on his show, I both tried to take on that responsibility and also share it with the other sort of artist curators that I involved in the project. Elena, and I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you? I remember distinctly though that as a curator, you felt a more committed sense to like, oh, but I can't go as far as the artist. I'm a historian. I, you know, and you felt, but that also shifted, and you allowed yourself in the exhibition that I'm only going to really plan the first one, and that I'll see what I learn from it, or I'll see how liberal I'll allow myself to be. But you did start in a way where you felt there was this kind of rigid responsibility. Which allowed you, which the artists allowed you to have as well. And again, you know, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but I think that it's important to Absolutely. talk about your own how. Absolutely, it allowed each of these versions of the retrospective to be radically different. Not only because, sort of, I did feel that responsibility to um, to show the earliest works, to present things, although they were not presented chronologically in any strict sense, but more or less roughly 
um, to show a great variety of his work, including things that had been little seen and, and other more known pieces. But I remember being shocked that Yan Vo, one of his first curatorial decisions was to decide that he didn't wanna show any of the very early works. And for me, I thought, but, but it's a retrospective. Um, and he said, yes, it can still be a retrospective and decide not to show these early works. He also made a decision, for instance, to hang Untitled America, um, an outdoor light string in front of the home, um, literally to be seen out the window of the technician who worked at the institution who had built um, the manifestation of the light string. So it was he, for him, Felix's audience of one became such an important sort of part of his thinking about Felix's work. In Carol Bove's version, care became the thing that was really central to her thinking about Felix. She said, one of the things that's too little talked about is how much his work demands that we think about caring for it, that it needs daily care to be replenished, candy to be you know, filled up. So she moved herself and her family for the month and a half of the exhibition to Basel to be able to care for it. Daily, she was in the exhibition, straightening up the piles, deciding on the heights, deciding on the weights, cutting the, the golden curtain beads that had you know, fallen a bit too long. Um, that was her interpretation of Felix's work. For Tino Segal, it was um, responsibility, the responsibility that Felix had handed over um, to other artists and uh, the radical sense of mutability. And he showed this in the most subversive way um, by having a show where every single day at every moment, it was constantly in motion. So if you would have visited the MMK um, during Tino Segal's version of the show, you might have, and, and it has a very particular architecture with many, many rooms, I think something like 22 rooms. Um, you might enter one room and you would see what looks like the beginning of a Felix Gonzalez Torres retrospective with a selection of works. And then you might go to a second room and realize they're installers kind of moving works around. And many audience members thought, oh, I've, I've entered an exhibition that's not quite finished. Um, but actually it was installers, artists that, that Tino had trained to constantly move one version of the exhibition and to move it from one room to the next and to the next showing um, each time how the light strings could be radically different um, in their formation, how the candy piles could, um, could as well, changing the heights and the weights of everything and moving them um, live through the exhibition for the whole duration. So each of these artists had a radically different starting point that emerged from the work itself, just as I had taken the idea of um, sort of questioning authority as my own starting point in the work. I, I, that's a really beautiful accounting of that exhibition, Elena, so thank you. And it, it also, it sort of reminds me of something that um, just when you're describing how each of these artists really tuned in in a very sensitive way to what the work asked of them. Um, and uh, really that, that's sort of my interpretation of what your description. And I, I wanted to, to ask Rosa again, um, sort of a, a, a similar question. And, uh, you know, we have mentioned this idea of influence about, you know, or change, how you have changed the work or how, how the work has changed you, how, we, how Felix's work has changed you. And so I wanted to ask you, Rosa, um, what, do you, what do you feel, you know, in thinking about Felix's work, in showing Felix's work, um, and you talk about how it always exists in the present for you, what do you feel that the work asks of you? Um, in the same way that each of these artists thought really in such sensitive ways about what the work asks of them. Um, well, uh, I would say that uh, that's a difficult question to answer because I am personally, I, I don't, I'm very difficult for me to reach perfection. And with Felix's work, I'm always thinking of perfection. How do I do this? So that's why every time we're going to do something that's out of the normal, I tell Melissa, let's call Andrea Rosen. We call Andrea, and I, I, li I like to ask, I mean, people that are in, 
I mean, I know that Andrea cares about Felix's work and she really is in charge of it. And I'm just uh, a collector and um, I, I couldn't, what, what do you- But, but, in, that, but in that being said, I mean, I know that from day one, when I started working with Rosa, you used to tell us that we are the caretakers for these pieces. Yeah, we are the and caretakers, but no. we, have to be, right. we have to be very careful not to do things as a caretaker. This is Felix's work, it's not my work. It's, I, I, but Rosa, I, I was in presence there. Let's I think it's what the wonderful is that you is that you it sounds to me like what you're saying is that what the work asks of you is um, is to sort of have this constant dialogue and this engagement with others um, and that that's a fundamental way that you understand your responsibility to to have these connections with other people so yeah, well, I think with all that, that with all this like like I, that's why I mentioned Andrea her name has been mentioned so many times because but you know Rosa. I, I think saying, your uh, name uh, is on the certificate of the, like, I want to, you know, it's a really interesting thing that this idea of the audience of one that's come in and what is the public and what is the private because, and who is the work for and Elena so beautifully brought up installers, like, you know, we've, you and me, Rosa have spoken about how the guards and the, you know, um, or a docent may be more engaged in, or in Felix's work, like, is the work for the docent, is the work for the audience, is the work for you? And to imagine that you and Carlos have um, decided to be the public, there was a question that was posed earlier uh, before the panel mm -hmm. about um, how does Felix's work is so important to Miami? How does, uh, how do we make Felix's work more public in Miami? And it was like, well, the Rosa and Carlos de la Cruz collection is public, it is free. So you've chosen to do that, but you also have the right as an owner to put that piece in your house and be the audience of one. And I wanna to refer to this audience of one because it's also a quote that's very much known in Felix's interviews, which is that at one point Felix said, my audience of run one is Ross and how essential it was. And this idea of like, you know, this constant flux between is my work, you know, is there an ideal person who I know that I will make the work as open for as possible and as pure without explanation because I know there's this person that understands me better than potentially anybody. And is there also, if I could, if I can make my work with that kind of understanding and believe that everyone can understand my work. So sometimes you have the right to be, and you know, for many of Felix's works, the owner's name is on the certificate. You, and I'm not going to exist for everyone, but forever, but the owner will always exist. So it's this interesting, um, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna work will always so it's the same thing. Somebody else is gonna, and, and, yeah, Andrew. <laughs> Uh, I think that uh, one of the interesting questions that, that Felix uh, raises is that most of his work must have been thought out because it, it has this constant uh, theme of uncertainty in it. Uh, mm -hmm. And the question is whether uh, he was influenced by the writings in the 70s uh, and the discovery of, of uh, the development uh, of the quantum theory of mechanics and, and mathematics which basically says uh, that, you know, uh, it deals with uncertainty uh, at a very theoretical basis. And, and in my mind, uh, these double stack keys, uh, all these things uh, have to do uh, with a profound, because he was very much a philosopher as a person. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I knew him well enough to be able to say that. Uh, and, and he thought about these things in a very abstract fashion. And we were going from a, uh, from a system of mathematics uh, that is now in, uh, being developed at, at, at a, uh, for computers and is gonna open up a vast new uh, area of, of uh, data processing and, uh, and, and development of theories. And I have a feeling, I mean, I don't have any, uh, but any basis for it, uh, but just a coincidence in time, he probably read something, uh, some of these uh, articles that covered that topic. Well, I think it's a really, really good point and something I think about all the time, Carlos, but, and I think that, that he may have read 
that as he was an ardent reader of everything. Right. But I also think that in his relationship to the knowledge of death and permanency, and we assume that, you know, there's so much about this notion that we think that permanency is something that is going to last forever, you know, something that's concrete, something that's made of bronze. It's such an interesting discourse that we're in right now about monumentality and thinking those things last forever. And Felix was really interested in his immortality. And the immortality came in this shape of shifting forms. And I think that that's very related to what you're talking about, how the form may not be in the form that you think or these sort of theoretical forms, but how they continue and subvert and change in their form, but still stay solid in, an, in, an, in a seemingly unsolid way. So um, I think it's a really astute point about we tend to want to think permanency is something we can see, but all of the sort of theoretical science is about, you know, what what exists without us seeing it. And so I think it's a really astute- And the uncertainty of what we see. And the uncertainty, but also, the you know, we of having our two influence- Interpretations are more than two. Don't you think as collectors and as a curator that what you're doing is creating influence so that you leave something behind and you've changed the structure and Absolutely. you know you were having a collector to be having a collection you want to like leave something that will transcend time? Absolutely. Absolutely. And as a curator? <laughs> I mean, I the funny thing is I think Felix, this working on Felix Gonzalez Torres's work, as much as one shape, one thinks, one shapes it, um, shapes the a public's vision of it or a public understanding of it, it has not only shaped me, but continues to form me as a curator. There is not an exhibition that I make today where Felix is not there with me. Um, pushing me to question an exhibition's form, questioning me, asking me to uh, look to the work itself to find the protocol by which an exhibition should be organized. And maybe one story I can tell that uh, concerns this suite of exhibitions um, that, uh, that unfolded after the sixth version of this retrospective, um, it was like we were deinstalling the very last ver version of the show and packing everything up. And the two, um, the two clocks untitled Lover Boys, Perfect Lovers, um, was, was there on the wall. And I had made the decision at the beginning of the project to, um, as most people know, it's two clocks that touch, um, that are presented on the wall with kind of new batteries put in at the beginning and invariably they fall out of sync and maybe even one stops working when the battery dies. And I had made the decision that if and when this was shown in any version of the iteration, we would have started the time at the same time at the beginning of the project, but we would not change it over the course of the iterations. So by the last version, the sixth iteration of this retrospective, there were the two clocks and there we are about to pack them up. And there had been a whole four or five minutes between the two clocks in terms of their time. One was, I don't know, showing eight o'clock and the other 8.04. And I remember kind of turning to my watch to because I, I wanted to know actually, well, which was right? What time was it? And I realized I had yet a different a third <laughs> variable. And I realized this, this work that had been, that I had always read was about romantic love and impermanence and about, you know, two perfect lovers touching that actually it held within it secretly or behind it um, yet another sense, another implosion of meaning, which is that there is exactly this uncertainty that Carlos spoke so beautifully about. There is this, um, questioning of authority because you don't know which one is telling you the right time. Um, also, not just love, not just immortality, not just impermanence, but also the fact that neither one would ever be right. You know, I was laughing when, um, smiling, laughing, when Elvis said, uh, something about how surprised, how, how convincing Felix must have been, you know, this young artist 
convincing the New York Times to do this piece. And it, it made me just laugh because I don't, I can't think of another artist who, you know, through a kind of generosity, gift, all of those things was so uh, convincing that he, you know, he's certainly made me dedicate my life. <laughs> he's dedicated, had every collector, uh, had every curator. It's really interesting also to see that I don't know another artist who's so, um, whose existence really um, was e equally important, you know, uh, held up by he, you know, by an installer, a curator, an owner, a, you know, whoever was involved that uh, the audience, you know, that he, he kind of cr created different roles for each person to feel convinced to sustain the work. And that's an also a really, uh, it's come up in this conversation, all the different roles of um, how he convinced us to, uh, you know, change us in order to uh, sustain the work as well, but. Mm -hmm. And also working within the institutional structure. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. And understanding this dissemination. Yeah, the dissemination of this information and these pieces and how, you know, now, for example, Robert, again, showing the, talking about the works that are now in his home or uh, the images of the pieces of paper that might find themselves on the street. He understood that. And he, and that was part of the work itself, that it would reach out into the world. Through choice. Um, I, I, I did just just before, I mean, I know we, we're at the end of the symposium, but since we're the last panel, we maybe have a little bit of time for a few questions. Um, so I kind of wanted to pose, it seems like these are some questions that, that maybe both uh, Elena and Andrea could weigh in on. So this is sort of open to both of you. Um, but one of them sort of specifically mentions the foundation website. Um, so two questions that I'm kind of going to synthesize here broadly around this notion of performance in Felix's work, which I think is a really interesting and, and nuanced um, topic, certainly more so than, than we can fully address here. Um, but some questions about um, how that idea of performance figured in Tina, the exhibition that Tino curated, Elena and um, Justin Polera has mentioned in an interview, um, Felix talking about himself as a, as a theater director. Um, but also, Andre, Justin mentioned in his question uh, the, the sort of the working categories on the foundation's website, which maybe you could talk a, a little bit about the overlaps there and the, the, the utility and how those are conceived. And he was just pointing out that there is not uh, a category for performance, but but that you know he mentioned works like Untitled Arena, um, Untitled Go Go Platform, and other works that involve this dimension. So um, I think just just given the time, um, maybe to talk a little bit just broadly about both those categories, but also both for um, Andrea and Elena, how this idea of performance uh, sort of plays out in different ways in Felix's work. Should I start? Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe I would start by answering that I personally, but I can only speak personally, I don't know that performance would be the right word mm -hmm. um, that I would use for Felix's work, but the performative, um, perhaps, in the sense of that it is work that is operational. It is work that um, is performative in that it's always changing but it's also asking of its audience um, to participate in that. And typically, you know, our ideas of performance are more, you know, there's a stage, there's someone on it, and there's a clear sense of the audience out there that doesn't influence what's happening on the stage. And I think my understanding of Felix that it was just the opposite, that these lines were blurred, um, that, the, that the participants the visitors, the people who dared to take a candy, even if they didn't know for sure if they were allowed to or not, or um, a stack, a piece of the stack of a, a paper, were um, became part of the work, became part of making of the form of the work and the disintegrating of the sort of authority of the form uh, of the work. And so for me, that was really um, so is sort of crucial. Now in Tino's case, I think it's really interesting. He's an artist that we think of um, rightly so as a 
artist who works in the field of performance, but he was very specific. In his role, he was playing the role of curator a curator, an interpreter of Felix's work. And what he wasn't doing was staging a performance. So he didn't train the, um, the people that were installing Felix's work how to do it. He left it completely open, how they would move the paper stacks, how they would move the candy piles. They even invented their own tools to be able to more efficiently do so. He didn't instruct them to make it sort of look a certain way in the way that he might one of his performances. He really thought of it as honoring Felix's work by curating Felix's work in this way. And the installers were simply meant to move it from one iteration um, to another. And to that sense, for instance, you might know that Tino Segal never allows his own performances um, or his own sort of performative work to be photographed but we have ample documentation of his version of Felix's show because he doesn't think of it as one of his own works. It's a curatorial sort of proposition. And, and so we can show all those amazing images of people, um, of installers moving stacks of paper and changing the form of the exhibition. Um, I, I was really, there was another question that was posed earlier on um, by uh, an audience member as well, which was, had Felix done any performances in the way that he had done when he was in Puerto Rico? And um, in, you know, a, we had seen that question before the panel started. And then I was thinking when Elvis was presenting the piece about with the ice block and Felix's actual body on the ice block. And I, it made me think a lot about how Felix, um, and as we are, this is an anniversary of Felix's death, actually, the idea of the absence of his body and how Felix thought about the absence of his body. And so many of the works were made without his hand. How was he going to have the work exist without his hand? And you know, by, they were made by commercial photo labs. They were made by people deciding. There was another question about like, well, how do you decide what candy is used? It's, there's an essential part of Felix's work, which is it should be manifest with ease. And the idea that someone else is able to make decisions with ease about material was um, essential to him. And even if that meant you know, the form, the work always exists because it did exist. So it's physical form or even whether it was physically manifested didn't matter. But I think it's really interesting to think about this idea of performance, which is an artist performing and how Felix probably really tried to remove his own body um, either in the making, which he spoke about but also performatively where the works themselves perform. And those are both stagnant works and malleable works that they perform, every context they're in, they are performing. So I think that that's, um, I think he was extremely conscious. I don't know an artist who was as conscious about his decisions. And part of it was about how his body, the works are so much about body, about his body, about other people's bodies. And yet, how do you remove the body and let the work perform into the future? Um, so I think it was purposeful that he didn't continue per performance. Uh, post his early work. Um, well, I did, I guess, just want to offer to Andrea and, and to Elena and to Rosa um, the opportunity to ask one another any other questions or to share anything else as we get close to 7.15. I mean, and also just thank you all so much for what you've shared in this panel. Thank you. Well, big kiss to everybody. Thank Andrea. You. Thank Lena. you to everyone. Let's <laughs> hope well, we have another one like this. Yes. Yeah. To more. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for everyone. We include Carlo, because Carlo, he is much better than I am. Oh, no. Carlo, of course. <laughs> He can Thanks. answer things so quickly. So I, I always say, Carlo, get in, get in. You're a team. I, I know, Melissa, you look great too. <laughs> no, well, thank you. Felix would thank say, you. the best revenge is a life well lived. So. That's, that's, that's right. You're right. Yeah. So. Right. so. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you.
Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I think Sylvia is just going to come on for a minute um, to, to thank everyone for attending. Sylvia? So what a wonderful afternoon and evening. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Um, this celebration began with a wonderful overview by Dr. Robert Hobbs, followed by a panel presenting Felix's early career in Puerto Rico, including, as Liliana mentioned, the secrets in Felix's work, the third panel brilliantly presented questions related to presentation and ownership, as Andrea described, a purposeful contradictions and, as Carlos mentioned, uncertainty of what we see. So if you missed any part of this celebration, you can use your Zoom code and tune in and you can see the entire program. And also we'll be um, presenting it on the BASP website very shortly. My gratitude goes out to Art Bridges for the sponsorship of this celebration and to our speakers and to our presenting um, our partners, the De La Cruz uh, Collection and the Felix Gonzalez Torres Family Archive. And to all of you, thank you for attending. Thank you. <laughs>